Mean Brews. My name is Matthew Harold. A um, little bit of an introduction of, for myself. I've been home brewing for about 16 years. Um, very early on, I started to get into all grain brewing and decided um, I wanted to create my own recipes and not just copy what others had done. Uh, it's very difficult as a novice brewer to um, get into understanding how fermented product will taste. Uh, or fermented grains and malts and hops will taste after the process of fermentation. Uh, so I went through the uh, um, endeavor to really look at what was out there. It had one had won awards out there in the competition circuit. And I started this about 2006 and have been working on it for 14 years. So gathered a lot of data uh, and I wanted to share that data with uh, the homebrewing community. Um, a lot of times when we go to homebrew meetings or if you look on the forums online or anything like that, you'll see a lot of opinions. And I want to separate the fact from opinions, you know, look at the, the real data, interpret it uh, to show what you need to do uh, or what grains or processes you need to, to use, what yeast to use, etc., in order to determine um, what makes a good beer. And uh, hopefully you get use out of this as I have. I've done really well on the, with this system on the homebrew circuit. Um, so let's get right into it and start the um, tutorial. Uh, mean Brews tutorial, understanding the data. So what beers am I going to cover? Um, that's a pretty good question. Um, we're going to cover every beer style in the 2015 edition of the BJCP. There's some styles we are going to exclude, which makes sense when I get into them. Anything that's like got big ingredients like fruit beers that can be multiple styles. Uh, smoked beers, which can use, you know, any different base style of beer, you know, adjunct, wood age, experimental, those type of things where there's really no correlation between one recipe to another. Um, we threw those out. Um, there's not a really good way to examine those and um, find something consistent across all the recipes. However, um, we do include some BJCP provisional styles and some other styles that aren't really covered by BJCP including, you know, Katharina Sour, Mexican Lager, um, Adam Beer, uh, Pearl Beer, Beer de Champagne. You know, these are styles that aren't yet defined in BJCP, yet they have a place. And uh, we will be covering those um, so that we can help you make a better beer. Uh, where did we get our data? So, mostly from the internet. Um, I would say 99% from the internet, also through some of the winners in our homebrewing club, the Cane Island Ailers in Katy, Texas. Um, a lot of the web pages I used very early on are now gone, um, and I have to go to the web archive to go find those recipes, uh, but the data is still captured. Um, we're always looking for new recipes, um, particularly on some vague styles or not very popular styles. So. If you've got an award-winning recipe that you would like to share with us for us to use uh, in our data for future episodes, um, please send it to meanbrews at gmail.com. Um, we are we're just getting started filming. Um, we're starting out with Hefeweizen, so any other any other um, recipe for any other style of beer, um, please do send it on if you want to uh, share that with us, and we will try to get it included in our data. Okay, so some of the things we're going to present while we do these um, episodes are going to be very statistical. And I want to kind of walk you through what we've done to try to get some sense out of this and, and use the data for our benefit. So looking at one variable of a beer, it's original gravity, right? And here I have a scale on the x-axis showing a, a range of um, original gravities. And if you look at one style of beer and you start you know, tallying up how many beers there are or what the original gravity is for all these winners within this one style of beer, you end up with some sort of curve that looks like this. Um, this is what uh, we traditionally have called the bell curve. Um, you can plot it out like this once you have those numbers. Um, in statistical sp speak, this is what's called the standard normal distribution. And there's a couple properties with the standard normal distribution that you want to take note of. Um, first of which is what is the mean or the average. Uh, so for this, this beer in particular, it's about 1.051 original gravity. The other is the standard deviation. Um, and this is a calculation that tells you, basically characterizes the shape of the curve. A large standard deviation means there's a broad range of, um, you know, 
different uh, wide range of, of numbers. They're not tightly grouped together. They're spread out. Uh, short, it'll give you a big flat curve. So meaning you'll have a, a bunch of different variation in, in that variable. Um, the smaller the standard deviation, you'll have a very sharp peak curve, which will tell you you need to use that you need to be within that number, that mean, within a very small bound. Um, so that's important to characterize the curves that we'll be presenting um, on our uh, future broadcasts. The other thing I'm going to present is when I give this curve, I'm going to show you, I'm not going to show you every data point of every beer, but I will show you where the largest and where the smallest within that data set is on this curve. So pretty much you don't want to be uh, in these areas outside the curve that I'm highlighting here. Another thing I'm going to do is, where possible, if there's a, um, a BJCP specification, this happens to be the original gravity curve for Hefeweizen, which is going to be our first uh, broadcast. I'm going to show you the range that BJCP says you should be within. <laughs> what you'll find, you know, in this particular case, and in a lot of cases with beers in the competition trail, uh, people tend to, to err on the side of the high side of the, the numbers. Um, more than 50% or about 50% of the winning beers here or above the highest specified by BJCP. So I will show that. It's not always the case, um, but it's good information to have to kind of give you an idea of where you should be formulating your recipes. Another type of graph that I'm gonna show is the same bell curves. This uh, plot right here is, um, it's a plot of the mash rest for Hefeweizen. And um, it, you know, it shows the different rests from, you know, beta-glucanase all the way up to the alpha and beta rests. And on, I've taken the liberty of manipulating the height of the bell curve to show how many recipes used uh, these specific rests. Uh, of course, 100% use the alpha and alpha rest up here. Um, however, you can see for you know the protein rest, only 50% of the recipes did a protein rest. On each one of these curves, there's a, again, the lower and upper bounds of uh, the, the data set that made these up. But I think this is a, a very good way to show, um, you know, how many recipes or what's the propensity of, of people to use uh, different, uh, different rests in their mash. Um, we'll use this for other variables as well, but this is a, a really good one uh, to share. Some other graphs we'll use, we'll use, you know, pie charts, which you're familiar with. Uh, we'll use bar charts to show, try to try to manipulate and tell you, not manipulate, but we'll try to uh, explain, you know, why people use these, uh, how many people use them, and give a recommendation on if you should use them in your recipe. Another thing we're going to use is sliders. Um, so two of the sliders that I've started to use are style stability. And this is, you know, how, how has the style varied over time? So, on, you know, we'll plot these out on a, on a, on X chart across the slider and we'll have from one end stable a very stable recipe versus a very evolving recipe and so what do we mean by that a stable recipe is a classic style like a, a bitter a Weizen or a German lager where you know just through the years there there's been very little um, variability over time um, on the other end we'll see things like you know American pale ales IPA saisons Berliner Weiss, you know, things that over time have just evolved. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's, that's going to be a good reflection of, you know, take the data for what it is because it's, it's changed over time. So if you see that, you might want to say, well, there might be a, a time-dependent variable here um, that I need to take into account with my recipe. Uh, the bottom slider is style variation from minimal to a broad variation. And this is basically within a time span, like now uh, or back when, uh, what is the um, variation that we've seen between recipes? You know, and um, some, some that we see minimal variation are things like Hefeweizen, which is, you know, um, Pilsner and wheat malts, and things like Czech Pils, which is Pilsner malt and Sats hops with Pilsner Keller yeast, right? American lagers, which is the two row or six row with uh, either rice or, or corn. Um, these very, very, these do not vary at all or much between the recipes that we've seen when. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, Scottish ales, 
you know, malt bills all over the map. And I'll give you an example of later later on in this uh, tutorial. Uh, Saison, they can be dark, amber, standard strength, you know, uh, pale, um, high strength, spice, not spice, they're all over the map. Um, and Baltic Porter is another one where I'll, when we get to that recipe, I'll show you how, how variable the, the recipes really are between winners. Um, talking about grouping, so this is important. One of the um, one of the ways we group malts is important to understand. You know what you should do when you put together or formulate your recipe. Um, <laughs> looking at an example here, I talked about Scottish beer before, but a wee heavy. Um, these are the uh, all the uh, specialty malts that were used in all the winning wee heavies in our database. And if you tried to formulate a recipe from this, you'd have a real you'd really struggle with it. Uh, so what we've done is we've replaced that with some certain subcategories, um, broken them down into crystal malts, toast, roast, adjunct, and smoked. Smoked won't be in every uh, style, very few styles, and then there'll be some styles where we'll have spice, spice additions, and how much percentage of is spice additions. Um, this again is for We Heavy, and you can see um, for this particular bar chart, um, crystal malt makes up 8% of the grain bill, toasted malt, 5%, roast, 1.2, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll further break this down to make it more, um, to give you more information in that, um, you know, for that toast malt section, that 5% of the grain bill, most of the recipes here used aromatic uh, or biscuit or melanoidin. Um, so kind of help you, guide you on your selection of toasted malts to use in your recipe. Uh, we strongly suggest keeping within, you know, this percentage of your grain bill for a particular recipe within the bounds of the standard deviation we talked about before. Um, however, you know, picking something, a toasted malt outside of this, um, um, you know, you can't have success. However, um, we strongly recommend keeping within these. Hops, we had to group hops together. People like to add hops at all different times of the boil. Um, so we looked at what they contribute and broke them down as follows. Uh, bittering hops will be anything over 20 minutes, including first wort hops. Flavor hops will be 10 to 20 minute addition, additions. Uh, aroma hops will put as 0 to 10 minute additions. Whirlpool hops are going to be the combination of two. Any 0 minute addition um, if the beer uses a whirlpool. Uh, so if you have an IPA that you're going to add some a hop stand or whirlpool some hops, and you put in hops at 0 minutes at flame out, um, those are really going through a hop stand. So we're going to count those as Whirlpool hops in, th in that case. If it doesn't have a dedicated Whirlpool hop addition, we're going to count those as aroma hops because we're assuming you're chilling it down immediately. Uh, any, any specified Whirlpool hop in the recipe will go into the Whirlpool hop uh, category. Biotransformation hop. This is any hop added to the fermenter um, during active fermentation. And dry hop additions or any any hop additions to the fermenter after active fermentation has died down. Yeast, um, we are going to try to group uh, where possible white labs and by yeast, why yeast strains, uh, as indicated by Mr. Malty. Um, that's a good uh, source of information. If you haven't been to the Mr. Malty website, I encourage you to do so. Um, we would like to include any other... Uh, uh, yeast labs, if they'd like to share with us their equivalency charts um, and publicly say that they're the equivalent to another, uh, we'd, we'd be happy to include those as well. Please reach out to us, meanbrews at gmail.com, if you want to include your data in our set. And that's basically it. Um, thank you for joining us for our first episode. Um, hope this has, hope we have fun with this and hope you have a great time with this as well. Um, this is really exciting for us to share this with you, and we hope uh, we hope you get value out of it. Send us feedback. You know, shoot us an email at meanbrews at gmail.com or here in, in the comments section of any video that we're going to produce. We're going to try to do one a week. Um, let us know what you think and uh, what, what we missed, um, what is of value to you, what isn't of value to you, and we'd be happy to include that on our future episodes. So... Right here at 15 minutes, um, close to 15 minutes, uh, I'll let you go. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and have fun perusing through our uh, catalog of recipes. Bye-bye.